Well, good evening, everyone. This is our Mount Tabor Wednesday night Bible study on this September 2nd, the beginning of our September month, as we are waiting for folk to gather and come on as we begin our, our Wednesday night Bible study this evening. And uh, we'll wait a few moments for folk to, to jump on and as we get to explore Scripture this evening. I'm glad everyone is coming, and you all are welcome this evening. I am Pastor Rodney Street Wilcox. I'm pastor at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church. And uh, I'm glad we're all gathered here for this evening. We'll wait a few moments to get started. And uh, I'm glad that you're here. We have a few passages that we're going to look at tonight. We're going to be addressing the question... Are you ready? As over the years, I've heard some songs, sing some Christian songs and hymns. Uh, are you ready? And we're going to be asking the question tonight, are you ready for the return of Christ? And we're going to see what scripture, how scripture has to say about that. So we'll, well, we all are welcome to gather as we're getting to start in a few moments. If you are up to it, let me know that who you are if you're here. You don't have to. Some people just like to remain anonymous, and that's okay, too. That's one of the, the joys of doing a Bible study online. You can remain anonymous, too. Like I said, I'm Rodney. I'm pastor here at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church here in Crestwood, Kentucky, Kentucky, outside Louisville, Kentucky, for those who are joining from other places in the nation. I hope you've had a good day. I'm still adjusting. My two children are up at college in Texas and Ohio, and I'm, my wife and I are getting used to being empty nesters again. And uh, yeah, good. We're going to wait a few more moments, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to start with prayer first, and if there's a prayer request that you might have, uh, you can go ahead and put in the comment field a prayer concern or a prayer request, maybe a praise, something you're thankful for. As we get started this evening, we'll offer prayers for it. Yes. And as we're going through this evening, if there's questions you might have or uh, uh, comments that you might have, uh, you're welcome to put those questions in the comment field. Uh, do know that there's about a 30 second delay between what goes on the comment field and to the point that I see it, but I'll try to address the question as it comes. As it comes. Just remind everyone you are welcome this evening. Martha, I hear that unspoken in a praise, and uh, we want to welcome those who are here, those who have indicated, and those who are coming here. We're going to go ahead and start off with a little pray and prayer this evening. I just welcome everyone, just uh, as always, just to take a deep breath. I always remind the people of Mount Tabor that the first gift that God gave to humanity, that was of breath. And uh, it's the first gift that we receive from God as we enter into this world. And the last thing we do before we leave it and join into God's presence. And so uh, I like invite everybody to take a deep breath and to become aware of God's presence, to be still and know that God is God, that God loves us. that all are welcome in his presence. Just to breathe in the, the reality of grace and hope and God's justice, to breathe out all the anxiety and fears. Take some time to become still in God's presence and his power, his mystery. The psalmist declares that God is good and his steadfast love endures forever, that his faithfulness lasts throughout the generations. So we thank you, God, for your goodness, your steadfast love, and your faithfulness. 
throughout all generations, throughout all of our days. We come thanking you for the air that we breathe, the beauty of a day, the rain that gives life to the earth. Or a glass of cold water and a cup of hot tea for the hugs of a grandchild, the, the licks of a pet, and all good things, God. For freedoms and choices, second chances, God. For your grace, your mercy, your discipline, all that that molds us into who you desire us to be, Lord Jesus. Today we lift up to you, O Lord, many who are sick and hurting here at Mount Tabor and around, those who are listening in, for the unspoken request uh, from our sister Martha and the praises she offers. The many at Mount Tabor who are facing surgery, recovering from grief and the loss of loved ones. We pray wisdom and knowledge upon our leaders, President Trump and Governor Bashir, and all those who serve in all levels of government, Lord. We pray you guide us this evening as we look at your word and spend a little time just hearing you talk to us. I pray your mercy upon me as I seek to interpret your scripture, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, good. I'm glad, as I said, I'm glad that everyone is here this evening. Some of you are uh, listening from different locations in Oldham County and across the United States. And so this evening, we're going to ask the question, are you ready? And uh, are you ready? And I hear that a lot. And uh, I grew up as a Baptist boy. Uh, my my Baptist roots were in East Texas near Galveston. I was in a town called Pine Tribe Baptist Church in Dickinson, Texas, which is just near Galveston. And that was a uh, that was something to be thought about. You know, the idea that Jesus is going to return one day, that the world's coming to an end. There is a a new heaven and a new earth to come, according to Revelation 21. And so one of the questions is, are we ready for this? And what does scripture say about what it means to be ready? Now, some people, though I don't think they mean to do this on purpose, maybe some scholars and teachers might create an idea that being ready for the return of Christ might mean that somehow you are, that you're fully able to interpret all the mysteries of the book of Revelation or passages in scripture that talk about the end times that the sense is that to be ready means if you got the correct understanding and i don't think many of these interpreters mean to say that but sometimes the emphasis be, seems to be on do you believe there is a rapture and how that plays out or what you think about are you pre or post or pre-trib and all those words and phrases that are used sometimes but is that how scripture understands it? scripture focus on the knowledge we have so what does it mean to be ready? So we're going to look at a few passages this evening, if you have your scripture. Uh, we're first going to look at a parable from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. If you grew up in churches, you may have heard this parable, but if not, we'll just read it. So Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, it says, Jesus is speaking, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridemaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. So immediately we know that five of these were foolish and five were wise. Well, why was that? Well, when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And all the bridesmaids got up and turned, trimmed their lamps. And all the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. They weren't prepared. But the wise replied, No, 
there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. While they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. And it ends, and it ends with verse 13. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And so these parables in Matthew 25 are part of a series of passages where Jesus is dealing with a variety of end issues uh, and particularly related to the, the end issue that the Jewish people are going to experience in AD 70, but it's also dealing with the, the, the uh, uh, other possibilities of, uh, uh, of the end of the world coming. And there's a sense in this parable of, of being prepared for something. Now, in this particular parable, there were ten people, and immediately the parable tells us that some were wise and some were foolish. And the reason that five of them were foolish is because they didn't have extra oil to keep their lamps heated, uh, lit it up. And uh, like good bridesmaids, they were there to assist the wedding party, uh, but they weren't fully prepared. And then when there was a delay... When things didn't happen the way that everybody thought should happen, and sometimes when we are dealing with end of the world issues, things don't happen the way we interpret them. They don't happen the way we think they should happen. Well, in this passage, they, these women, these brides, are not prepared, and so they go off to get to get resources, but they lose their chance to come to the wedding. And, uh, and so in this passage, when I think about being prepared to meet the Lord Jesus, one of the things that this parable points out is that you need to have what you need for the coming of the Lord. You need to have what you need for the coming of the Lord. And you need to be prepared for what you have before the obstacles, that the, this, the changes that may happen for the coming of the Lord. Because... You may have something, things may change, and are you going to be able to adapt to those changes? In some sense, this parable kind of describes a kind of equipped preparation, that you are equipped for the return. You're equipped to prepare for the, the, the thing when things are going to come to you, and get, you're equipped for the wedding. And so this idea of being a kind of equipped preparation will play out in other places in Scripture. And we're going to look at a few other passages, but I want you to hold on to that parable of having an equipped preparation. What does it look like? What kind of equipment should you have to be prepared for meeting Christ? Well, let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-13 through 13 to see what that means. 2 Peter chapter 3, 1 through 13. So what does it mean to have the equipment that helps you be prepared for the coming of the Lord? So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, it says, Peter is speaking, But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like one day. Automatically, you'll see the time issue, as we saw in that parable. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So this passage is in the context where critics have said, well, you're saying Jesus is coming back and the, the end of the age is coming, but we don't see any sign of his coming. So Peter's responding. And he says that, you know, you cannot judge God's timetable by human standards. That uh, how God is doing things is slightly different than what we're doing. So like in that parable, the, the bridesmaids had a, a kind of understanding of what should happen. But they were foolish because they weren't prepared. They didn't have enough equipment. On this passage, the time issue comes up. 
So he says that the Lord is not slow about his promise. Peter's saying he's not slow about it, as some think of slowness, according to how we understand slowness, but is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but all could come to repent. In other words, Peter is saying that what we view as slowness is actually God's grace in action. Jesus, God has a whole broader picture that he doesn't want anybody to perish, to be lost. He wants everyone. And then he goes on verse 10, he says, but the day of the Lord. Now, this was a common Jewish motif that the day of the Lord means that when it happens, that history comes to an end. And for the, for the Jewish people, this was a restoration of the greatness of Israel. But this, as the New Testament church began to understand, day of the Lord, we refer to day, Jesus as the Lord. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that's done of it will be disclosed. There will be a drastic, universal, something's happening. In other words, it will not be quiet. You will know, you will know, that the day of the Lord has occurred when it happens. There won't be any like, oh my God, did it just happen? No, everybody in the universe will know it's happened. That's what Peter's saying. There's going to be a transition from the old to the new. Hey, Bonnie, welcome. And so it goes on. Now, in verse 11, so since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons are you to be leading in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for the hasting of the coming of the, the day of the Lord. Peter says this, all this is about to happen, so then should we not be people of holiness and godliness waiting for it to happen? So to be prepared for the coming of Christ for the day of the Lord means that you are living a life of godliness and holiness. That holiness would in mean in sense that you're set apart, that you're not like what is going on in society and godliness, a reflection of who God is. And God's love and justice, mercy and grace, the fruit of the Spirit, all those things. And that we're in a waiting mode. We're waiting. So in the first passage, we talked about the parable of the ten bridesmaids. They were, five of them were not ready. One, because they didn't have everything they needed. They didn't have the right equipment. To have the right equipment means you're going to be leading a life of holiness and godliness. In other words, you're going to be reflecting something. So when Jesus shows up, Jesus is going to know you because Jesus is like, oh, you're, you're acting like me. And you're going to say, yeah, Jesus, and I know you because, hey, I'm following you. So to be ready in this passage is to mean that you are living as Jesus would live. That that what it means to be wise. The parable that early on talked about being wise. You got the right equipment and the right equipment is a life that's focused on Christ, a life of holiness and godliness. John Wesley talked a lot about holiness. Uh, that we are different, set apart, that our lives reflect a love of God, neighbor and enemy, how we respond to our enemies, to the poor, how we live our lives in relationship to what we own, areas of sexuality, all that. So Peter says that because this time is going to come upon us, let us be living lives of holiness and godliness as we're waiting. And so basically, we are waiting as holy, godly people, but we're not forcing it to happen. We're waiting for it. Okay? All right, so let's go on and look at 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. See what he, this passage has to say about being ready for the return of Jesus. It says, the end of all things is near. Peter's speaking. So he's declaring the end of all things is near. And he's talking at this moment to the people of his time, 2,000 years ago. He's saying to them, the end of all things is near. And, he, and so 2,000 years, 2, years later, we're still declaring the end of all things is near. So Peter says, therefore, because this is true, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. 
be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifest grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must, not, must do as one speak in the very words of God. In other words, what comes out of your mouth is what God would speak. And so, or how we would talk about others. So whoever speaks must do as one is speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and amen. So in this passage, Peter looks at what it means to be ready from another angle. To be ready for the return of Jesus means that we're living disciplined lives in our prayer life, that we're serious about our commitment to Jesus, that we're loving one another, serving one another, speaking good things. That's what it means ready. So it means when Jesus returns, Jesus is going to see that. A few years ago, I saw this bumper sticker. Maybe you've seen it. <laughs> And on it, it said, uh, Jesus is coming back. Everybody looked busy. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. That the bumper stickers declared, Jesus is coming back, so everybody looked busy. But the, as funny as that is, it actually tells us something. The, the bumper sticker tells us that part of being ready for the return of Jesus is that we are busy about the work of Christ. That we're, we're, we're busy in the love of others and what we do with our mouths, how we serve people, how we welcome people into our lives, that kind of busyness. On the other hand, you might know when Jesus returns, but if you have not been living a life that G Peter describes here, then you may know when he's going to return, but you're not ready for his return. To be ready for the return of Jesus is to be living as if Jesus is already here. Let me say it again. To be ready for the return of Christ Jesus is to be living a life as if Jesus is already here. But the reality is, he is here in the Holy Spirit with us. So the question is, what kind of life are we living in him right now? Well, let's look at another passage of scripture. Another passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This is Paul speaking to the church at Thessalonica. He says, now concerning the times and the season, brothers and sisters, you, need not to know, you do not need to have anything written to you. For yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness. For that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep at night and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he says concerning basically the day of the Lord, he says that it'll come like a thief in the night. Now this is very interesting. You know, a lot of times in, especially in our American society, I've noticed this over the years, People seem to get really concerned about, is Jesus going to return when things are going bad in our nation? That's when people start thinking, okay, I guess it must mean that Jesus is going to return because we've got a pandemic and this bad thing is happening and that bad thing has happened. That must mean Jesus is going to return. But what's interesting is that Paul does not say that. He says, for your, in verse 2, he says, For yourselves you will know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come. Paul's saying it's when everybody's doing good. When there's peace and security, everybody's happy, things look great. That's when the day of the Lord will come. 
which tells us something. The temptation sometimes as American Christians particularly, when we got everything going for us, the money, the health, and all that stuff, sometimes that very stuff can be the very thing that tempts us away from Christ. We get lazy. We get relaxed. We begin to fall asleep, as this passage says. In other words, we're not ready for the return of Jesus then. You know, when the church struggles, and this has been true for like, if you look at for the 2,000 years of the history of the church, the church was at her best when she was suffering and struggling. Really. You see, this is one of the regular things we see in the history of the church. The church was at its most vital, powerful self for the first few centuries of the early church when it did not have any power politically or economically. It was at its best. Places throughout the world where the church struggles under constant, that's when there's a sense of vitality and a commitment to Christ Jesus. But when things are going well, sometimes we can get lazy. That's when it gets dangerous. And that may also be a good sign that we're just may not be as ready for Jesus' return because everything's going great. So for me, I don't think a lot about Jesus' return. I do think about Jesus' return, but I don't get a sense of interesting that it's going to happen when things are going bad. It's more about when things are going great, when we think everything's cool. Because you think about it, a thief comes when we least expect it, when everything seems to be perfectly in order. Then the question is, are we ready? So as we've been looking at these different passages of Scripture this evening, one of the things that we can glean from all of them, that being ready for the return of Jesus has nothing to do with you having the book of Revelation correctly interpreted, if you know who the Antichrist is or the mark of the beast, having that, that has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with if Israel does this or Israel does that or whatever. To be ready for the return of Christ is to be living a life as if Jesus has already returned and he's already here. So basically, it's what we've always taught. It is to follow Jesus faithfully in the good times and the bad times. When Jesus returns, if we are already following him and living in his life, then we will be ready. There's a story told. I don't know. Some have said it's a story about of Francis of Assisi, I'm not real certain. I, I, I don't know. But we think it was but it's a story of an ancient person who was well-known follower of Jesus. The story goes that this person was, and we'll go say it's Francis of Assisi. He was out and he's gardening. And someone walks up to him and says, Now tell me, Francis, if you knew that Jesus was going to return today, what would you do? And Francis said, well, I guess I would finish up my garden. See, I think that what that reflects is that the Christian leaders of the past, those who love Jesus, they're not going to need to do anything different than they're already doing because they will have already been doing the work of the gospel. They won't need to need to make drastic changes so that when Jesus returns or when the day of the Lord comes, They'll be like, oh, Jesus is here. Cool. It will not be surprised in the sense, oh my gosh, I need to do something different. No. To be re ready for the return of Jesus is to be living your lives as if Jesus has already come. And the reality is, he has already come. And the reality is that he's with us in the power of the Spirit now. And the reality is, is that we will meet him in the next five seconds. Or in the next 50 years. And some of us are going to meet him maybe tomorrow. As we die. All is possible. 
So the question is for all of us this evening, are you ready for, for to meet Jesus right now? Have we been living lives that honor Jesus, that love God, our neighbor, and our enemies? Have we been living lives with what we say with our mouths, what we do in our actions, how we treat those that we like and how we treat those we don't like? Have we become open to the full salvation of Jesus? How we answer that question determines if we're ready for Jesus to return. So in other words, let's follow Jesus today, right now. All right, brothers and sisters, I thank you for your time that we've had this evening as we talked about Are You Ready? It's never too late to be ready to give your life to Christ Jesus, to recommit to his work, his kingdom, and all those good things. All right, well, I'm glad you all were here with the evening with me. If you have any questions about this, you can always text them to me, place them on Facebook, and I'll try to respond to them next Wednesday. Just a reminder that this coming Friday night at 6.30, we'll have our short community prayer time. And then on Sunday, we will have our 10 o'clock worship service where we'll be doing communion this coming Sunday for those who will gather in the service. We'll also be doing uh, Facebook Live and for those who would like to participate in communion for this coming Sunday, I will be there after the worship from 11 to 1 to receive people for the, the communion and I will be willing to deliver to those who would like to receive it. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, remember that Jesus loves us and that in his power, we can always be ready for him. We always can be ready for him as he comes and leads us. So now go in the peace of Jesus. Amen. And I'll talk with you later, everybody. Have a good evening.